Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And uh, we're going to be looking at the Isaiah scroll today. Uh, not specifically from the Dead Sea Scrolls, although if you're here in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you ever want to look it up here. Uh, right here is chapter 2. And, of course, there are two Isaiah scrolls. One they don't really make public for you to see. Because, after all, uh, as one Israeli scholar said, there are meaningful differences. Hmm. Makes me wonder what's written in there. But I don't have access to that, so I don't get to see that for myself as of yet. I'm not saying that it won't happen. I just don't have it as of yet. We're going to be referring, though, to the Dead Sea Scrolls from Cave 11. And uh, But uh, to start off with, I owe a debt of gratitude to my wife for this particular message because she kind of inspired me to go into this. Because when you're dealing with what she's dealing with right now, the evangelicals, uh, the, 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 the Talmudists, the, the rabbis that are all saying that, well, Israel had to become a nation again, uh, they want to claim that scripture has never been fulfilled and that this one here in Isaiah chapter 2, specifically verse 3, at the latter half of the verse written in green here, for out of Zion should go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And you'd be surprised at how many people believe this was never fulfilled, including the evangelical community. I mean, it's kind of odd, right? Uh, you get people like some of these very, very well-known evangelicals like Paula White, many others, that are saying that you have to learn from the rabbis. Okay, what are you going to learn? Talmudic teaching? Uh that's something that Jesus certainly went against through his entire ministry. Hmm. Well, let's just stop there for a moment and let's examine Isaiah chapter 2 here. Let's get started with it right away here. And uh, we take Isaiah chapter 2, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the top of the mountains and he shall be exalted above the hills excuse me and it shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it and actually that could be unto him instead of unto it and it might make more sense when we get into verse 3 and many people shall go and say come Come you, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Je uh, the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Well, wait just a minute. If we say many people shall go and say, Come you, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of of the God of Jacob and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths that his is referring to the mountain and the house of the Lord Wow that's why when you go back to the antecedent here in chapter 2 and all nations shall flow unto it no Aliyah right there no but all nations will flow unto him. Think about it. Interesting. Well, how do you back that up, Steve? Well, let's look at this issue about the mountain. And it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the top of the mountains. Let's go to the Dead Sea Scrolls here in 11Q13, 11Q14. And I'm going to blow this up a little bigger. I want to make sure you're able to see it very well. To his aid shall come all the gods of justice. And he is the one who all the sons of God. And this is the day of peace which he said through Isaiah the prophet who said... And that's quoting from Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger. Now the feet of the messenger are on the mountains. Who announces peace, the messenger of good who announces salvation. 
saying to Zion, your God reigns. Its interpretation, the mountains are the prophets. The mountains are the prophets. Now, I actually agree with them there. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 2, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the top of the mountains. He is the fulfillment of the words of the prophets. And if the mountains represent the prophets, he is the mountain upon the mountains. He is the mountain itself. It is Jesus Christ, the mountain, the messenger upon the mountains established upon the prophecy of the prophets. Think about it. Jesus said, search the scriptures. If you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Going back over here to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the messenger is the anointed of the spirit, as Daniel said about him, until an anointed prince, it is seven weeks, and the messenger good announces salvation is the one about whom it is written to comfort the afflicted. Its interpretation, to instruct them in all the ages of the world. Wow, look at that. To instruct them in all the ages of the world. Again, the Messiah is the one that's to be the instructor. In truth, has turned away from Belial and will return in the judgments of God as it is written about him, saying unto Zion, your God rules. Zion is the congregation of all the sons of justice, those who establish the covenant, those who avoid, avoid walking on the path of the people, and your God, Melchizedek, who will free them from the hand of Belial. And as for what he said in Leviticus 25, 9, you shall blow the horn in all the land. Isn't that fascinating? Well, it doesn't end there. I actually discovered some very shocking information out of Isaiah chapter 2 as well. So clearly, though, Jesus Christ is that mountain. He is not only the mountain, but he is the Lord's house that shall be established as the top of the mountains. In other words, like uh, climbing up, I hate to use the word pyramid as an analogy here, but maybe kind of like that, you know, all the bases here, but right on the top. Christ built upon the prophetic words of the prophets themselves. Isaiah 9, 6. And to us a son is born, a child is given, right? Many others. Isaiah 52, uh, uh, you know, prophesies of Christ. David speaks about Jesus coming. Micah, Zechariah, Zephaniah. How many more could we say? Malachi. All speak of the coming of Jesus Christ. So he is the mountain on the mountains. And I thought it was fascinating that they actually no noted that. All right, let's continue on. And he shall judge between the nations and shall decide for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, I begin to realize if Jesus is bringing the uh, the law is going to and the word of the Lord is going to come from Jerusalem, and we know that the prophecy is speaking of Him, Jesus Christ. Then the nations that are here here that will they, they will beat their swords into plowshares, etc. And it's actually using the word goim or Gentiles. So we could translate that instead, right? says right here, Veshaftuf ben Hagoim. And he will judge between the Gentiles. Okay? And, and we have, the, and many peoples, La Amim, Rabim, Ve Katatu, Ve Harabotam, Ve Itim. They're going to turn their, their plowshares and their spears and the pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. See? Lo isha goi el goi. Now, 
This is where it gets really important. Nation shall not live sword against nation. See, they're just using the, the, the general term nation, but as a singular. But it actually is a singular as well in Hebrew here, goy, as an individual. In other words, the Gentiles will have received his message of love and they're not willing to fight brother against brother. See, up here, Veshaftuf ben Goim, and he shall judge between the nations, is plural. You come in here, Lo Yolasa Goy, El Goy, Charav. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and it's a singular sword. If it was if the goy was a plural, it would literally have chavarim, the swords. They wouldn't lift their swords against one another. So when you're reading here in verse four, we realize because the gospel would go from first Jesus came to the Jews, and then his gospel would go into the Gentiles. Paul being one of the first ones to take it, take it to them, right? And they learn. They learn and they're not willing to war against one another. Just like in Israel today, Christian Jewish people will not fight against Palestinian Christians. They consider them brothers. But the nation of Israel, the, the Jewish leaders there, they'll bomb them and everything else and could care less. And that's not just in Israel. That's all over the world. Sadly to say, there's many, though, that don't even care. Like in Ukraine, they don't care. But I know Christians there that are not willing, even in Ukraine. Western Ukraine are not willing to fight against Russian Christians because they consider themselves brethren. That's why it is goy. That is why lo yes, uh, isa goy. El goy charav. They are not willing to go against one another. It gets even more interesting, though. That's only the beginning, right? O house of Jacob, come you, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob. Who's forsaken them? Oh, that's an interesting. Because what's the antecedent in this here? Oh, how said Jacob, come you and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob. Whether it be, let's just say, we'll just say for argument's sake, it's the Lord that's forsaken them. But let's see why. All right, because when you're looking at this, it makes it appear the way that the evangelical world is trying to teach you to get behind uh, the modern state of Israel and the Talmudic rabbis of Israel. They're trying to get you behind them because they're saying, well, Jesus never fulfilled this scripture. This is something being fulfilled in modern days and the law is going to come from, uh, and the law will come out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. They seem to be too blind to recognize that Jesus Christ fulfilled this 2,000 years ago because of the way they interpret the scripture. But oddly enough, if you continued on into the chapter, you would find out there was nothing good about what was going on in Israel 2,000 years ago. Because he says, O house of Jacob, come you and let us walk in the light of the Lord. He's wanting you to walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, for they are replenished from the east and with soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the brood of aliens. Literally, uh, Nachaim, which are the strangers. Do you know what the strangers really are? Nephilim. That is what it's speaking about. It is clearly, and I never saw this before, God was still angry and had forsaken the people of the house of Jacob because they had replenished from the east 
In other words, they had intermingled their seed and grew their numbers through the soothsayers of the Philistines. And they pleased themselves in the brood. Hmm. Brood of aliens. Let's look at that over here real quick. Let's go over here and take a look at Isaiah. And we'll take some, we'll do some little breakdown real quick here. Isaiah chapter 52, or excuse me, chapter 2. And we're going to go to that verse 6 here. In the children, there you go, that's what I thought it was. The, the yelled of strangers. Please themselves. And the children of strangers. All right? Nechai. Just like I told you. They are adulterous, as it says. Different, alien, foreign, outlandish. Here we have Isaiah making this reference. They replenished from the east. And the, what was east of there? It was Babylon. Isaiah is clearly making reference to Ezra chapter 9. Now when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, The people of Israel and the priest and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. Lands, plural. Doing according to their abominations. Even the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. What do these all have in common? They were from Philistine. All right. For they have partaken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the Holy Seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been first in this faithlessness. If you read in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it goes a little bit more harsh in it. And Isaiah also does the same. Their land also is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. You know, I thought that was interesting too. I think it's in Zechariah. Let me see. It was Zechariah. Where was it at? Hang on. I got to find this. This is very fascinating for me here. Um, maybe not. Maybe it was. Was it Genesis? Nope. Malachi. Yep, Malachi. He shall sit as... A, let's, let's look at Malachi real quick. Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall clear the way before me. Reference. Jesus references this scripture regarding John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Hmm. Who, who's who, the, he, I, I, behold, I send my messenger he shall clear the way before me that me is speaking of Jesus and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple he's talking about the body that is the temple he would come to not the physical temple and the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in behold he cometh saith the Lord of hosts He's the what? The messenger of the covenant. What did Isaiah 2 say he would do? For out of Zion shall go forth the law. The law is the covenant and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And what is he? He's the mountain upon the mountains. He is the temple. He is also, and he will teach us of his what? Of his ways. What did Malachi say? The messenger he shall clear the way before me. Verse 2, but who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap. Wow. The Gentiles seem to get it because they're willing not to kill each other over it. But you're going to find out in Isaiah chapter 2, the Jewish people are still having a hard time with it. 
He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. What did Isaiah 2 say here as I brought it out? O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord, for you have forsaken thy people. O house of Jacob, for they are replenished from the east with the soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the brood of aliens. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land also is full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. So it doesn't matter what all you have, how wealthy you might be or whatever the case may be, he's still going to refine you anyway. Let's continue on. Their land also is full of idols. Every one worshipeth the work of his own hands. He's not talking about the Gentiles, friends. He's talking about the house of Jacob. That which his own fingers have made, and a man boweth down, and man lowereth himself, and thou canst not bear with them. Enter into the rock, and hide you in the dust from before the terror of the Lord, and from the glory of his majesty. That rock is Christ Jesus. Bo betsur. It's not the cleft of the rock. The lofty looks of man shall be brought low and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. You remember what Jesus said over there? What was it in Hebrews? Uh, or excuse me, Matthew 23. I'll come back to this Matthew 24 in a little bit here. There's a reason why I had it there. Um, Let's see. Woe to you hypocrites, Pharisees and sages, because you build the tombs of the prophets and glorify the monuments of the righteous. Remember, he's come as a finer, a fuller soap. He said, Jacob, we saw what Isaiah 2 says about Jacob. All right, now think about it. If the law is going to come out of Jerusalem, or out of Zion, and the word of God out of Jerusalem. And everybody is wanting to jump up and down and say, oh, glory to God, it's going to be Israel. Israel is going to be back a nation again. And the law is going to be the Talmudic Torah and the Noah, seven Noahide laws for the nations. Are you serious? When he turns right around and after he tells you about who the mountain is on top of the mountains, which we have just proved to you is none other than Jesus Christ built upon the prophets and the prophecies that they gave. And then he turns right around and he says, for you have not, uh, excuse me, for you ha uh, has forsaken thy people, O house of Jacob. And he just blasts Jacob right in Isaiah. And you think Jacob represents 12 tribes. But you know, Jesus is coming, one, to deal with those that got all mixed up in that mixed up seed there, but he also came to call out his own. That's why he says to them, enter into the rock and hide you in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the glory of his majesty. For the Lord of hosts has a day upon all that is proud and lofty and upon all that is lifted up and shall be brought low. Now I find this interesting, right? We This is literally taking scripture in Isaiah 52 showing the coming of Jesus Christ, the prophecy that he would fulfill, that he would be the law that would go out of Jerusalem, out of Zion, and he would be the word of God out of, out of Jerusalem. And then how he begins to bring judgment upon the house of Jacob. And the only ones that seem to get it are the Christians. That's the true Christians, not the ones, the nominal ones out there that are sucking up to uh, Pharisaic rabbis. And then you look at Malachi's prophecy. Malachi follows the same trend. Now there's only, in the Hebrew Bible, there's only a chapter 3. Chapter 4, we separated that out because of the judgment of it. But it's, you shouldn't have separated it. Really and truly, you should have left it the way it was. Because the messenger comes, and he suddenly comes to his temple, and he does purify the sons of Levi. He goes on, I will come near to you, 
to judgment, and I will be swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers. Uh, there it is again. He's coming, a glorious coming. His way is going to be prepared. It's following right in tune with Isaiah chapter 2, but he's also going to be swift to judge the adulterers and the sorcerers. And what does Isaiah 2 say about that here? For they have replenished from the east with soothsayers like the Philistines. See, it says like, it doesn't say they're the Philistines. Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, etc., right? And they please themselves in the Yelid. Ube Yelidai Nachaim. That is in the children, in their children. It's literally saying in their children of strangers. They were so happy that they had these kids with a bunch of Nephilim. I guess because they become men of renown. I, I, I'm blown away by this. I, I don't know about you guys, but I am blown away. Going back to Malachi, let's move on down. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, where shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me, but you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and, and heave offerings? You are cursed with a curse, yet you rob me, even this whole nation. Bring you the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be more than sufficiency. You know, I know a lot of ministers that like to run around and make it look like, oh, you haven't been paying your tithes and stuff like that. I don't think he's really talking about it in that term, so to speak. Because he's actually taking and showing you it doesn't really matter. But if you did, you could now give God in the first place. And I will rebuke the devourer for your good, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your land. Neither shall your vine cast its fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you happy, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been all too strong against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein have we spoken against you? You have said it's in vain to serve God. What profit is it? I have kept his charge. And that we have walked mournfully because of the Lord of hosts. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they work wickedness are built up. Isn't <laughs> that the truth? Yea, they that work wickedness are built up. And that's exactly not only was it 2,000 years ago where they lifted up the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the sages of their day and made them look like they're somebody great and wonderful. Now the evangelicals are lifting up these Talmudic Pharisee rabbis that call for the death of Christians. Oh yes. Did you forget Rabbi Mitzrachi? When he says, and he's given, now he doesn't just do the Christians, it does all, and Buddhists and all, the, anybody that's not Jewish, he said they're all idolaters, worshippers, he says, and he says JC for Jesus Christ, he said, and the Christians that worship JC, two, two, what does he say, billion, all worthy of death, according to the Torah, that's what he says. Need I remind you they put Jesus to death because he didn't say he was the son of God. The high priest said, I adjure thee by the living God. Tell us if thou be the son of God. And he says, thou sayest. He rips his, his garment and he says, what further need we? You've heard, you've all heard of his blasphemy. Right now, they are on a major campaign to minimize Jesus as only as a brother of the Jews. Dare say he's the son of God and watch what they do to you. Then they feared the Lord and spoke one another and the Lord hearkened and heard and, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. What did Jesus say? 
when the, when they came back and they were rejoicing that the devils were subject, he said, Rejoice not that the devils are subject unto you, but that your names are written in heaven. Again, it's all about Jesus. Now, you get on down. Verse 19 is the beginning of chapter 4, verse 1 for King James Bible readers. For behold, the day comes and burns as a furnace, and all the proud and all that work wickedness shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall set them ablaze, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Jesus said, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He also is the root and offspring of Jesse, but with them... Their root is not Jesus Christ. Jesus says, You are of your father the devil, and his works you will do. Do you remember that? But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in its wings, and you shall go forth and gamble as calves of the stall. Now I have said that could actually be a reference to this binary system that is coming. Healing, why? Because it just cleanses off the earth. Not that we're planning on staying here because Jesus did say that where I am you may be also. I go and prepare a place for you. Remember that? He didn't say he's going to be prepared here. I know a lot of people have that idea, but let's go back. Let's go back to Isaiah 2. Though. Let's further go down. Their land is also full of idols. Everyone that worship the work of his own hands. We're in verse, our chapter, verse 8. That which his own fingers have made, and man boweth down, and man loveth, lowereth himself, and you cannot bear with him, or bear with them. Enter the rock and hide you in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be brought low, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts hath a day upon all that is proud and lofty and upon all that is lifted up and shall be brought low. And upon the cedars of Lebanon they are high and lifted up and upon the oaks of Bashan and upon the high mountains of all the hills are they lifted up. Are lifted up, excuse me. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 18. And the idols shall utterly pass away. And men shall go into caves of the rocks and the holes of the earth from before the terror of the Lord and from the glory of his majesty when he arise to shake mightily the earth. You know, this goes from the gospel of Jesus Christ, the law coming out, the Gentiles actually receiving it, not wanting to fight and kill each other. But when it comes to Jacob, they're still a messed up, mingled up seed with idols and everything else to the point that finally God has to bring a judgment and they're going to go all high in the caves of the earth. And that day a man shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship to the moles and to the bats. Yeah, because when that system comes through, you ain't going to give a flip about your silver and gold no more. To go into the clefts of the rock and into the crevices of the crags from before the terror of the Lord and from the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake mightily the earth. Cease from man in whose nostrils is breath. For how little is he to be accounted. And Malachi goes into all of that. You shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do make saith the lord of hosts remember you the law of my moses excuse me law of moses my servant which i commanded him into horeb for all israel even the statutes and ordinances behold i will send you elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and ter terrible day of the lord and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers lest i come and smite the land with an utter destruction jesus does apply the heart of the fathers to the children to john the baptist but there's not one single scripture that applies the heart of the children to their fathers that's when elijah comes back remember what jesus said i showed that to you recently if you can receive it, talking about John, he said he is the Elijah that is the future to come. That is in the Hebrew, Matthew. The future to come. John was already dead. Verse 19. 
Why is this mention of Moses? Is it Moses and Elijah? I don't know the answer to that. But I do know one thing. They both were there when Jesus was going to be crucified. They were on Mount Transfiguration. They taught him all about what was going to happen. Again, what do you have? The prophets and the mountain upon the prophets. Wow. Think about that one for a little bit, right? There you have it again. They're on the mountain. And here you have the two prophets, Moses and Elijah. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the mountains are the prophets, right? The mountains are the prophets, right there. And it says the same thing in Hebrew, by the way, if you want to look at it. 17, let's go back up to verse 17 here. Uh, okay, here you go right there. For Shru HaHarim, Hamah HaNavim. There you go. It's interp the inter their interpretation. The mountains. Hama? The what? They're the prophets. I love it. I love it. Do you even know, you even think they realize it's speaking of Moses and Elijah? See, Moses has got to come back and say, look, no, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law. I'll tell you what. I mean, think about it. This, this is amazing to me. I don't know about you guys, but this is absolutely amazing to me. Why did I have Zachariah here? Thus saith the Lord, I return unto Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Hmm. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Everybody's looking at this for some future event, right? Verse 11, But now I will not be unto the remnant of this people as the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. For as the seed of peace, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all these things. Only the remnant. You ever notice Acts chapter 2? And they were dwelling in Jerusalem. By the way, that word is Judean. Uh, let's take a look at this. That is X. Chapter two. And we are Judean. See it right there? It is G2453, the Greek word. They put Jews, but the actual right word here is Judean or Judean as a country in the sense of as a country, a Judean that is belonging to Yehuda. Oh, wow, didn't know that, did we? Oh, gosh. All right, so let's go back to it again. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem... Judeans, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Their ancestral home was Israel. And now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were what? Born. So they were not born Judeans. They were Judeans by birthright, you would say. In other words, their ancestral land was Jacob's land. Corinthians, Medes, Elamites, and dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Figria, Philia, and Egypt, and the parts of Libya, about Serene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. So they also had converted, you know, a lot of uh, Gentiles to their beliefs. Cretes, Arabians, 
We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Don't forget, Jesus had sent not only his 12 apostles, but he also sent the 70 out to what? He said, go only into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Wow. So that's why when we get way down here, when <laughs> Peter says, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. they were also guilty in calling for his blood because the Pharisees had talked him into crying out for Barabbas instead of Jesus. That's interesting. As um, one messianic teacher says, Baraba, son of the father. Yeah, he's son of the devil is what he was. Jesus was the son of God. Big difference. What can we do, men and brother, to receive this eternal life? So we go back to Zechariah. That's the remnant. The remnant was because though Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant would return. Acts chapter 2 is that remnant from all over the world that came together. It was only a remnant even though Israel was as the sand of the sea. And they ended up believing the message. They ended up becoming heirs to the promise. Right? Let's see if there's anything else that I had on there. Not right at the, at the moment there. This is the blessedness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus is the Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of God, the Most High. And that's why we know he is Jerusalem. So when you go back to Isaiah chapter 2 and we look at the fact not only is it that, uh, that the mountain of the Lord of the house of God of Jacob he will teach us of his ways he will, we, we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. No wonder. Because Melchizedek who Jesus Christ is from the order of Melchizedek according to the book of Hebrews Oh, gosh. I, I'm excited tonight, and I trust it's exciting to you as well. You know, I'll throw in one more thing. I didn't bring it out yet. This is something in Matthew 24. I think it's verse 43. And we overlook this so often. Starting with verse 41, two women will be grinding at a mill. One will be taken, the other left. This is because the angels at the end of the world will remove the stumbling blocks from the world and will separate the good from the evil. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore watch with me, because you do not know at what hour your Lord is coming. Now we take this as a positive, this next verse, but it's actually in a negative, but it's kind of like inserted in the middle. This you know, if one knew at what hour the thief was coming, he would watch and not allow him to dig into his house. In other words, even at the coming of the Lord, the evil one is coming too, and he's coming to rob you of your soul. So when you sit there and you see Isaiah, the gospel of, that is going to come forth and the mountain is going to be standing on the mountains, the prophets themselves. And the law goes out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It was the law of Jesus Christ. Love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. Love your neighbor as yourself and love your Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. He said these two laws hang all of them, right? Now, isn't that interesting? Because the very next verse, and he shall judge between the nations or the Gentiles, and he shall decide for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and, and, and their spears into pruning hooks. And Goy will not lift up a sword against another Goy. He learned the law of Jesus Christ. He learned the word of the Lord that said, love your neighbor as yourself. The fulfillment of the word is in his very teaching of the law itself. And the Gentiles actually received it. 
Oh my God, do you realize that's why it went to the Goy to begin with? Because the Jewish people rejected it. Except for the remnant. There was a remnant. Thank God for the remnant of Israel. And they helped carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. Do you remember? I don't know if I, t I remember telling you this a while back. I don't know if you guys remember this. Remember what I said about Paul when he went down to Damascus? Or he was headed to Damascus and he was going to destroy the church. And then God stops him along the way. Wouldn't let him do it. And I told you why. Because the evil seed, both Jew and Gentile alike, would join together. Evangelical, along with Pharisaic Talmudic groups, would join together to destroy Damascus in the future, according to Isaiah 17's prophecy. That's why God stopped Paul. He would have destroyed the church at that time and there would have been no church. And then Isaiah 17 couldn't have been fulfilled. God had to stop Paul so that he would not fulfill that. Ooh, 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 ooh. Mm. I love the word of God. I love this right here. The Goy will not raise up sword against Goy. Why? Because the law that came out of Zion, Jesus gave the law, love your neighbor as yourself. They fulfilled it. Oh, I love it. Blessed be the Lord. He is so, so wonderful. I thank you for listening. And if this, if, if, if God is blessing your heart, and, and, and I want to thank you too, there were some people after Yana has done these last couple of teachings that were kind enough to help support the work we do. It really was a blessing for us that, that, that you cared enough. And especially for my wife, she has been through more than you could ever imagine. The whole family has, but my wife has suffered so greatly in this last nearly two years. And her making it back on is a miracle in itself. And so we want to thank you for your support. And if God lays it on your heart and you want to support the work we do, I want to say thank you in advance for that. Um, and truly the need is great. I, I don't want to underestimate it. It is. Uh, the more you stand for the truth, very few people will go along with truth. But I'm always excited to share the truth with you, as is she. And, uh, and I know she's planning on tomorrow as well giving you another update. And this message tonight, I think, only helps strengthen the updates that she's given. God bless you. Thank you for listening. We love you. And pray for us. We, will, we are and will be praying for you as well. Good evening.